Cover to Cover with Jack Foley, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. You're listening to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno, or on the web at kpfa.org. It's 7 p.m. Up next, Full Circle. Stay with us. Hello, welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by apprentices of the First Voice Media Action Program. Tonight's topic is addiction. You will hear an interview with Eli from the li- underground hip-hop group Living Legends and interview with Dr. Howard Kornfeld, a leading expert in the treatment of addiction, a personal story about the battle with crystal meth, and a story about drug use by street kids living in San Francisco. We are your hosts, Angela and Melody. Stay with us. No show in the Bay Area about addiction will be complete without covering the subject of methamphetamine. With the explosion of meth, especially the smoking of it, starting on the West Coast and sweeping East, tens of thousands of lives have been affected. The high experienced by a methamphetamine user can be described as an increase in wakefulness and physical activity and a decrease in appetite. A brief intense sensation or rush is reported by those who smoke or inject methamphetamine. Both the rush and the high are believed to result are believed to be a result from the release of very high levels of the neurotransmitter dopamine into areas of the brain that regulate feelings of pleasure. Chronic methamphetamine abuse can result in inflammation of the heart lining, rapid heart rate, irregular heartbeat, increased blood pressure, and irreversible st- stroke producing damage to small blood vessels in the brain. Also, heavy users show progressive social and occupational deterioration. There is hope out there. In this next piece, we'll hear the story of best friends and their battle with the glass pipe. Tonight, I want to talk about the glass pipe. And smoking meth. And how my best friend and I traveled the same road, smoking dope and partying, and not thinking much about our futures and how the choices we made affected us then and are still affecting us now. It must have started around the early or mid-90s. I'm not quite sure. But at that time, the pipe was new to me and my friend. It was exciting at the time, you know what I mean? It was was something different and... It was, I don't know, it was just something new, and we were having a good time doing it. It was fun. There's a lot of girls around. There's a lot of things I haven't never seen before, like wasn't used to, was just smoking weed and stuff like that. You know what I mean, it was just a whole different type of life, and it was fun at first, real fun. It was much fun at first. We were staying up late all night. We felt invincible, but there was a dark side. Well, I've been going to jail a lot because of it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a criminal, but uh, just being, just, just using dope, you know what I mean? Making a choice to use dope or have it on me or whatever like that has put me in jail a lot. Um, I've lost places to live because of dope. Uh, I've lost girlfriends. I'm fighting relationships all the time, fighting. You can't trust nobody. It makes it all bad. After a while, man, it's just like you need it to just feel normal. Then you're getting high. It wasn't fun like it was at first anymore. It's just, it's just kind of like you need it for like a subsistence, you know what I'm saying? First, it was just curious. Now, now it's subsistence because you just need to just like feel normal when you get up in the morning. If you don't, you feel all dizzy and feel weird and just like that, and you can't uh, feel like you can't cope. It's all bad, man. It's all bad. Like my friend says, the fun surely did fade. The trips in and out of the county jail were more frequent. The pipe wasn't just something we wanted anymore. It was something we needed. In time, the need was so great. We were just starting to blow off everything for the pipe. It was ruining us. 
I'd go to sleep at 4 in the morning and wake up at 5 and I'd wake up at 7.30, so I'd lose a job. That screwed me. I'd put off bills, bills for my water, bills for my rent, get my rent late all the time. Even though I had the money 20 times in my hand, I never, you know, I was late for, on all my bills. All my bills, have, they have to be, like, either shut off or someone has to, uh, you know, I either have to go down and pay them to get it turned back on or something like that. I, I never pay nothing, like, in the mail on time. It's, you know what I'm saying? Always, even if I got the money, I just don't want to, you know, run out of money, spend it all on this bill, and then not have enough for my sack. You know what I'm saying? And and selling, selling it, I've, I've sold it. I haven't done anything criminal, I, I can say that, because I was raised good, you know what I'm saying? But I haven't done anything, like... You know, like rob people or rip off stuff from people, you know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. And I, I do it, I work hard for my, for my money and I spend it on dope. I've always done it like that. But, but still, man, it makes it tough to, it makes it tough to keep a job. And then, you know what I'm saying? Cause you're, you're there, you're late, you're always, you know, in a rush. You're always, there's always a problem. There's always some sort of drama going on. You know what I'm saying? Your boss doesn't want to hear it. It's like you're working so hard and it's really so easy. You know what I'm saying? You just, like, do three times as much work to get what you, where you need to go. It's like running backwards or something. I don't know. It's, being late with bills was a constant for me as well. And the illusion was I was just struggling to get by. But the reality was all my money was going to the pipe. And like my friend says, robbing and stealing wasn't really our thing. But dealing and putting ourselves in places we should never be just to get a fix wasn't past us. Guns and violence were just a step away. Yeah, man, you just want to, you know, you, you want to get a sack or you want to get high, you know, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So sometimes you just go by somebody's house and, you know, you're not knowing where you're going. You're just with somebody who's, been, oh, we can go get high over here. Next thing you know, you're in with a bunch of gang members or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Or prison gang guys, you know what I'm saying? Or prison guys, just bad people, man, that, that maybe aren't the same as you and me, you know, where we worked or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And we were kind of honest, you know what I'm saying? But we just wanted to get high and we were addicts, you know what I'm saying? They were like all about crank and money and, and it's scary sometimes it was scary man you put yourself in other elements and sometimes you have to like you know try to act a certain way or be a little different than you really are you know what i'm saying just you know what i'm saying to feel comfortable being there you know what i'm saying it's it's not cool man i mean if i had a kid right now I, i'd never let want him to ever try it you know? After years of using meth together, smoking the pipe, our trails parted. Him moving to Martinez in Washington, and me staying in Antioch. And although we were apart, we both continued on the same destructive course. Smoking dope, dealing dope, and going to jail. And at the same time, we were also dealing with another side effect of the pipe. The isolation from our families thing is i don't talk to my family <laughs> when i'm on the pipe i don't talk to my family at all i haven't seen my dad and he's in washington state i haven't seen my dad since i came back down to california in 2001 i haven't seen him in his what, 2009 i haven't even seen my dad you know what i'm saying and, and he's getting older and i should i haven't I, I didn't talk to my mom for my birthday this year or for christmas last year i haven't talked to my mom for like almost a year probably my mom and dad i haven't even talked to him because i was clean for a year and a half and I was talking to him every day. I was calling my mom every day, just calling her about stupid stuff like recipes and stuff like that to make some food or something like that. You know what I mean? Now I don't even talk to my mom because because I'm on that dope and I don't I don't want to associate with my family because it's a big secret. But they all know when they look you you know when you look them in the eye, they can look right at you and tell that you're going on the pipe still. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's no big secret. I just don't talk to them, so the secret's out. <laughs> you know what I mean? They know what's up. And they pray for me and stuff like that, and they love me. And they want me to do good. And they want me to be off that pipe, you know, more than ever. But uh, I just don't talk to them, so I can't help it, man. I just, Right now, times are tough. Work's hard to get right now, and if I can get a sack right now and, and pawn off a little bit, it feels like I'm doing something, you know what I'm saying, and make a little money here or whatever, or enough to support my habit. Why not? I mean, I'm not, I've got 20 years in the union, and I don't got a job right now because it's ridiculous, you know what I mean? But uh, I can make excuses all day long. I know I don't should be on it, and my life would be better probably if I was off it, you know what I'm saying? The loss of years not spent with our closest family members can never be brought back. I, too, feel that pain. Personally, one thing I regret the most is the time I missed with the kid who would later become my stepson because I had myself locked in the bedroom 
or in the garage smoking dope. Those days can't be brought back. Like tens of thousands of other people in the world, the pipe has held us back. It has definitely put the brakes on my life as far as any, any type of success, success I wanted. You know what I mean? I mean, there's people my age. If I went to my 20th re- reunion right now, you know what I mean? There's people that own businesses and, and have houses and properties and are doing really well. And, and uh, since, since I started hitting the pipe, it's put, my, it's put my, anything I, I had going as far as big plans for a career or anything like that way on hold. I mean, I'm ridiculous right now. You know, I mean, I'm 40 years old and uh, got no money in the bank, don't own nothing, living in a motorhome in my friend's backyard. <laughs> ridiculous. The thing is, the pipe had put the brakes on our lives. We were really stuck at the same place we were 10 years ago, or even back a few steps. But here's where our stories change. Because in 2005, with the help of my family, I was able to beat the pipe. And it definitely wasn't easy. It meant not associating with anyone who used meth. Which meant I suddenly had no friends. And getting up and going to work without my normal motivation was a great struggle. But I made it. But I also ain't seen my best friend in quite some time. Until we met up again so we could tell our stories. I have to say, it did hurt me deeply to see my best friend still in the same situation we were four years ago. I had to ask what it might take him to give up the pipe. I have no idea. I don't know, man. Should have quit it a long time ago, man. Should have quit it when you quit it. We should have quit it before together a long time ago. I thought you quitting it was going to make me quit it. It just made me not talk to you. <laughs> I missed out on a lot of those good years, you know what I mean? We were really tight, and, uh, and I really don't know what's going to take to make me quit. You know, there's no more place to go but up now from where I'm at right now, so... I quit before because I had an ankle monitor on, and I quit cold turkey. I couldn't believe I did that, but I did. I don't know, maybe take an ankle monitor again to get me started. And I think I'm I'm on the road to get an ankle monitor here pretty quick, so... When I get when I get out to make a monitor, stay away from it, and uh, it's probably going to be what I have to do. Either that or go to jail with that threat, not do it. And then when I get out, prepare myself for when I get off that, prepare myself for the place where I'm not going to be around it, and I can just keep on trucking on that good foot. You know what I mean? Keep on trucking on the good foot, like my friend says. Staying away from people who do it is key, but it always seems hard to stay away. You have to constantly tell people who come by that you've quit. And to not come by anymore. You'll be fighting the battle constantly to rise up. But it is a battle we all can win. My first few days off the pipe, I went to NA meeting, Narcotics Anonymous. There I heard people with similar stories to mine tell me what helped get them through rough times. And that helped me get through some of my rough times. You know... With all my heart, I pray for you, my friend, to make it. And for all of you to make it. Before I left my friend, I got some last words. If anybody's out there listening, man, don't try it. Meth is, is no good, man. It's, it'll suck you in at first and you'll you'll find it fun and exciting and stuff like that. But it ain't that exciting. I'll tell you what, having a family and having a place to live and, and your bills paid and stuff like that and, and that... You know what I mean? Be able to go on a vacation and you want to do what you want to do because you got that money and, and no stress. It's way better than what we've talk, been talking about. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that fun. And it's overrated. And it's just all bad. It's bad. It's all bad. Just don't do it. Leave it alone. Especially don't pick up the pipe. The pipe has its own little mystique and aura about it, man. It'll suck you in and makes half the fun just handling the pipe. You know what I'm saying? And blowing a pipe and, and whatever, man. It's just stay away from it. It's the devil, man. For real. Don't do it. Leave it alone. Smoke weed. Now that you've heard our stories, and I know they might be dark or bleak, but remember, there is light out there. I beat this thing, and I know you can. And you can. And you can. I'll leave you with these words, which I heard late night, one night when I was out in the garage tweaking, locked in, 
I heard a man say, even if you're doing what you don't want to be doing right now, keep it in your mind that you want to quit and think about that every time. Also, tell your family, get them involved. You'll have to seek out help because the people you're surrounded by won't tell you to quit. You have to say it yourself, then do it. And to my friend, I miss you so much. I hope to see you again soon so we can hang out like we used to. Until then, here's some voices from some people in recovery telling us what it means to them to be clean. Being clean means to me is, you know, it, it, it's got me a life back with my family. You know, it's got people to where they would trust me. You know, it's just given me a better outlook on life. And, you know, I'm not out to just hurt people anymore. You know, I'm, I, I've got, feel, you know, it's gave me actually feelings back, you know. Just, it's given me a better life altogether, all the way around, you know, even though things happen still and you have bad days it's just things are better recovery rocks i mean it's it's uh it is my worst day clean is much better than my best day using it's changed my life and i am so thankful that i have been relieved of the desire to use you know everything about my life is totally different than it was before all my decision making everything I mean, it meant a lot. I mean, it means everything in the world to me, bro. Look, I got my family. I got my little seven-year-old little girl. Anything I ever wanted came to me just by not using and working the steps. Um, it meant to get my life back. You know, I mean, I went from living on the streets to having a house, being married, and lots of blessings, lots of miracles, real friends, an actual, get. you know, I mean, I do things that I never thought I would do before. Just little things that seem stupid, you know what I mean, but they're not. Um, I'm getting my kids back. That's a big blessing. So To be clean, it gave me a purpose in life. No matter what you did or who you are, God loves you. You can be the worst scandalous, dope fiend shooting, murderous thing on this earth, and God still loves you. So with that, he gave me purpose. And with that purpose, I stay clean. Uh, it means having my family. I have five girls from 20 to, down to um, one. And um, my 13-year-old actually left because me and my husband were doing drugs. And now um, she's ready to come back. And everything is just beautiful. But before, we didn't have our pg &E on. We were getting kicked out of our house. It was miserable. Being clean is just being willing to change your life and do one thing. And one, take it one day at a time. You know what I mean? If you really want to change your life, Stay clean, a lot of things will come for you. For Full Circle, this is Free Will and Franklin. Frank, thank you so much for that piece. And he's actually in the studio with us and has a few words he'd like to say. What's up, everybody? Yep, this is Franklin, and that piece was very dear to me. And I just want to say to my best friend out there that I hope you make it. And if anybody's out there that has a friend that's stuck on the pipe, stuck on meth, make sure that you convey to them that it's not a good idea. I found out when I was out there, there was no one there telling me, hey, man, it might be a good idea you quit that thing. There was everybody around me was always using. They take you with them on their journey of using and if you don't step up to yourself and say hey i think i gotta quit there ain't many people out there that are going to say that for you so if you know someone that's using might want to convey to them it's not a good idea and then uh i do have a song i want to play for my homie so good buddy this one's for you this is motorhead stay clean
this next piece is an interview I did with Eli from the underground hip hop group, The Living Legends. Um, Eli is a really old and dear friend of mine and, you know, one in a whole slew of folks that I have relationships with who have gone through addiction. Both of my parents are addicts. I have siblings that were addicts, friends. And so I think it's important to, you know, I wanted to do a piece about recovery. So this is it. This is Angie D for Full Circle, and I am here tonight speaking with Eli of the underground hip-hop group Living Legends about his struggles and triumphs over addiction. The Living Legends have been around since the early 90s and have their roots in the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Eli is a very old and dear friend and is also someone I knew I could call upon to be honest and candid about the topic for tonight's show, which is addiction. So, Eli, how long have you been clean? I've been clean for three years and four or five months. How has this changed your day-to-day life? It's changed in every way possible because towards the end of my active addiction, I wasn't focused on music anymore. I wasn't focused on friendships. I wasn't focused on family. All I thought about when I woke up is how to make my body stop hurting and how I'm going to get high max. So from the end of my using till now, I mean, obviously my whole perspective is completely different and I'm looking at the world through eyes that I'm supposed to be looking at it through, which is clean with no fog over it. The way I treat people, treat myself, bad habits and high and lying and all this stuff that comes along with being addicted to drugs and doing what you need to do when you're out there. It comes to light and you have to start changing those things about yourself. What do you think are some of the factors that made you fall into this habit? I personally believe that addiction is genetically passed. When I look at my family, like my dad's sister is an addict and she's still not stopping yet. Feeling like it's in your family from the beginning is one point. I was told by a very wise person once that I was born with stage fright of the world, which made me laugh. But at the same time, I think it's very true. Just the introverted, shy kind of person wanting to fit in always. You know, a lot of people when they're young, they want to fit in. They want to be with the cool people. And I actually denied that all the way until I got clean. I never thought the first time I smoked weed, I smoked because I wanted to be cool. And I thought I smoked weed because I wanted to feel like what it felt like to be high, which probably was part of it. But once I really started getting high and feeling like I was more comfortable in my own skin, then it became a form of hiding, a form of escaping my shyness. Did you feel that because you started to become addicted, you started feeling isolated from other folks? Isolated came along later on, probably, because, you know, in the beginning, it was just weed and then alcohol. And that was more like a social thing. It allowed me to get out of my skin and not be so self-conscious. And when you're drinking, you know, I feel like I had liquid courage, I called it. But once it got deeper into it and I started messing with the other drugs, the harder drugs, that's when I started isolating. And towards the end, the only person I was hanging out with was the guy who got me the drug, which is where it takes most people. It takes you alone. You're by yourself. You don't care. You know, it's just you and the drug. If you're just tuning in, this is Angie D on Full Circle. I'm talking with Eli of the Living Legends. Can you speak on some of the different substances you've been addicted to? Weed probably started me off, and that carried all the way through, but it was like weed, alcohol, to mushrooms, to acid, to ecstasy, then to painkillers, and then some coke, and then some You know, I did all of it, but once I found the opiates, that was the one that got me. That's the one I stuck to and what brought me to my knees, which, of course, the top opiate it is heroin and that's where I ended up. Do you think that your stage fright on stage and off stage has a lot to do with addiction? You're becoming addicted? Well, definitely had to do with my alcohol addiction because that's when I really started drinking is when we started performing back in the day and I was yeah, I was nervous. It's the opposite of my personality to be on stage in front of people. I don't like it. I don't want to be up there in the spotlight. So alcohol became my crutch and it became the way I was able to accept being on stage and be comfortable a little bit. Although now that I think about it, even when I was drinking before I got on stage, I still have butterflies, which is funny now. I mean, obviously, being a musician on the road, people put you on new drugs, new everything, so the alcohol moved on to the other stuff. You know, even if I wasn't doing that, I'm pretty sure I would have found my way. There's an epidemic in the music industry of artists being addicted and dying and not being able to accomplish what they need to, and most of these folks are some of the most talented folks in the group. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that addiction is so prevalent in the entertainment industry? It's a good question. And I know for a fact that some of the smartest people I've ever met are addicts. And some of the most creative people I've ever met are addicts. And maybe that has something to do with that DNA, you know, genetic 
thing that I was talking about earlier is maybe the creative human being has that tendency to get attached. Do you think any of it has to do with the fact that you are the party person? People come to your show, they want to see you off stage, you're, you're the man on stage, you have all these pressures to be the man off stage. I definitely think that has a lot to do with it as well. But man, it's always been like that. All the talented people have been the ones that fall victims to addiction. I don't really understand that all the way, but hasn't that always been the case? What are some of the things that happened in your life to make you look at yourself and decide to make a change? Well, the number one thing would probably have to be, how, how do I put this, Angela? People started leaving me that I cared about. People were leaving my life that meant a lot to me. And when I started realizing that even though it brought so much pain, I still kept going. That was a huge sign in the beginning. Then when it got to the point where I wasn't making music, I wasn't doing what I love to do anymore. Like I said, I was waking up, I was sick, and I was hitting up my drug dealer like, where are you at? And that's all I cared about. Pain was so great physically. I was metaphorically on my knees point where I was nodding off on the freeway driving like what is going on you know calling the ambulance on myself when I feel like I'm having a heart attack all these things combined was just that was my bottom and a lot of people's bottoms are different but I had hit a spiritual bottom I had hit physically a bottom that's what brought me to that point where I needed to make a change or I was going to end up dead or homeless or any awful way you could think can you let some of the listeners know some of the different steps you took to get clean and sober I know for me and probably a lot of people, there's no possible way that I could have stopped using without rehab, number one, because I was on the painkillers and the heroin and so awful, so hard. And I tried a million times by myself. And when I thought I was doing good, I was still smoking weed and still drinking and trying to take the pain away from the other stuff from that. But if I didn't go to a detox and a rehab, there's no way I could have done it. So when I first started realizing that I needed to get clean, I started calling around and seeing how much they cost and all that stuff. And a lot of them were ridiculous, like $30,000 up front for a month. I started thinking, this is impossible. How do normal people get clean? I, it's ridiculous. Eventually, I found this foundation called Music Cares, which is a godsend. I mean, they saved my life. The only reason why I found them is because we knew another guy that was a hip-hop dude that went to rehab and got it paid for through this foundation. So, you know, a couple of my friends helped me find this place, and they got me into a rehab out in the Valley of L.A., and they paid for it. If you are just tuning in, this is Angie D on Full Circle with KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley. I am speaking with Eli of the Living Legends crew. So, Eli, how did your addiction affect your family? Right after I went into rehab, I I told all my family they all knew. And my mom knew I was messed up because I'm really close to my mom. And on a couple of occasions, she was visiting me. I was in her purse and stole her painkillers. So she knew I was messed up. And she actually told me when she came to visit me in rehab that her, my uncle, and my cousin were planning an intervention before I did it for myself. So needless to say, they were just so happy that I decided to make this change, how it affected them before I got clean or in my addiction. I can only imagine a lot of our mind states as addicts is I'm not hurting anyone else. I'm doing this to myself, not anyone's business. What I do with my own body, it's not like I'm hurting other people. It's just me. But obviously that's not true because people who care about you are worried sick about you. Right. And you don't realize the effect you have on your relationship with them. No, not when you're so self-centered and just thinking about you all the time, which is what addiction is. It's just all about you. Do you have any words of wisdom and experience for any folks out there listening who might be going through their own bouts with addiction? They can get into a rehab. That is the best place to start. If I would have started going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings or AA meetings first, I don't know if I could have did that because the pain from the detoxing was so nasty that it's really hard to do that on your own. I got really scared that I would not enjoy making music anymore. In my mind, this disease of addiction was telling me that weed was a part of my creative process. And that had a lot to do with what I do in the studio and the music I make, which is a lie. And after that, it was just obvious to me that none of the stuff I was doing had anything to do with why I'm here on this earth making music. It has nothing to do with it. What's going on with you now, musically, project-wise? So much good stuff is going on now. This year is crazy because I just put out a project with my mom called On Sacred Ground, Mother and Son, and my mom is a folk singer, and we made an album together, and that came out March 10th, and it's getting so much positive response from people. It has a lot of heavy messages on there about, you know, addiction being one of them. Also, on the 21st of April, this new album I made with Grouch, 
comes out, which I've played it for you, Angela, and your feedback was that it sounded more grown up. And that's where I feel like I'm at right now. Is, you know, when I was still getting high, I would make some stuff, and I'm like, wow, I like this. The next day, I wake up and listen to it. Like, what was I thinking, man? I must have been high out of my mind. Now it's really brought down to a more pure level. It's all me, no cloud over my head. So the music is just spilling out now. And you just got finished working on a project with Mystic? And just finished up a project with Mystic that was been getting made over the last couple of years and finally is going to be hopefully coming out towards the end of this year or summertime. And I'm really excited about that because about the time Mystic comes back out with some stuff and the stuff we made together really kind of magical to me. And I think people are going to love it. It's just all happening at the right time. Yeah, so, you guys make a good team. I agree. Is there anything that you want to say to any young people out there who might be addicted or who might be considering getting clean and that they're not really sure how to make that happen for themselves? Please feel free to try and get a hold of me on MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, all these little social networking sites. If you get a hold of me with some real questions about these things, I will always get back to you. But I would say if you can't find a way to get into rehab, then get to a meeting. Find an AA meeting, find a NA meeting. There's a meeting for anything, anywhere. So, you know, just sit in the back of the room and listen. You don't even need to talk to anybody. You don't need to do that. Just you, you start coming to these meetings and you'll start hearing ways to beat this thing here. For Full Circle, this is Angie D. So that was a really great interview by Angie D. Next, we're going to hear an interview by Gloria Lowe. She spoke with Dr. Howard Kornfeld, who is a leading expert in the treatment of addiction and pain. He teaches at UCSF and holds his own practice in pain and emergency medicine in Mill Valley. He specializes in the utilization of the opioid pain medication. Today, he will tell us about the drug buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, and the history of opiate dependency. Thirty years ago, uh, a drug was introduced called buprenorphine, which has been highly underutilized all around the world, although that is starting to change. Although it's been around for 30 years, it's the first drug that mimics morphine type of drugs in effectively reducing pain and also effectively treating people who've become opiate dependent, whether that's from addiction or whether it's from pain conditions where they've taken a lot of uh, morphine type of drugs and when I say morphine type of drugs we can put uh, Percocet, Vicodin, all these kind of drugs are what we call the morphine type of drugs. They're full opiates and given over a period of time they will all create psychological dependency or eventually addiction. I believe that this drug is also the solution to the world's problem of lack of access to opiate drugs for pain relief because a program that would utilize buprenorphine could could have certain it, it has a safety feature that 
that prevents some of the abuse that could occur with other opiates. For example, the drug called Suboxone, which is becoming available in this country, has in it a substance that if the pill is crushed up and injected, let's say as a substitute for heroin injection, it won't work because uh, if it's taken as prescribed under the tongue, fine, it works fine. But if someone like crushes it up and injects it or snorts it or something like that, it doesn't work and even can reverse the effect of any opiate that's in the person's system at the time. So people tend not to want to abuse this drug. Also, it doesn't make a person high who is used to having an opiate in their system and is in pain. So it can, it can address the pain, but if they keep taking more of this drug, it doesn't make them euphoric or it doesn't make them stop breathing. In addition, once this drug is in the body, if a person, let's say, uses heroin on top of it, um, part, a, a large percentage of the heroin doesn't work. So it prevents overdose because uh, many addicts, when they in our early recovery, they, they get clean, you know, and but then they get the urge to use again. But when they use again, their tolerance is much, much lower and often they overdose and die. Most of the deaths uh, in, in heroin overdose or a, a large number of the deaths are from people who were trying to get clean and then got clean for a few days or a week or two, then used and then they overdose and die. And having buprenorphine in their system would prevent this outcome. And if this is such a great solution, and it's been around for 30 years, why is it so little known among the community? Well, there's many, many different reasons. Um, I'll go back a little bit to the history of opiates in general. So all opiates originally derived from the plant opium. It's called Papaver somniverin. It's a poppy. There's dozens and dozens of poppies, but only the opium poppy produces morphine in any significant amount. But the opium poppy contains, at a certain time in its development, maybe 10% more. People probably recognize the, the healing properties for uh, at least 7,000 years because these pods, they're called, of the poppy, have been found in very ancient settlements around the Mediterranean, in Switzerland, in Spain, in France. Even in these prehistoric uh, findings, as history developed, all of the early civilizations of the old world used opium uh, for sometimes appears ceremonial, uh, purposes, but most uh, of the time there's evidence for medical use. The ancient uh, Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians, they all used uh, the opium poppy. By the time of Greek civilization, it was highly developed, and Hippocrates, the famous you know Greek physician, he um, wrote widely on the use of opium for all kind of conditions from severe diarrhea to states uh, of course of, of pain but also uh, of other ailments when people were uh, close to, to dying uh, opium could be used and it lifted their spirits up and they had the the will to live and and so it was really a life-saving drug but it became much more well known in the arab world and that was the time of the rise of, uh, of Islamic civilization, and it became a very important uh, part of their medical uh, tools. It also migrated to China. A lot of people think of opium as originating in China, but it actually migrated to China in, in the year 400 or something like that. And it was used in China uh, medicinally as an herb, and it's part of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And what happened, though, is that it started to migrate back to Europe with the Renaissance, 
and some of the early physicians of the Enlightenment brought opium back into uh, England and into Europe. It migrated to the east and China adopted in, in smaller ways the smoking of, uh, smoking of opium as uh, like a recreational uh, pastime. Opium was grown in India and often shipped to China. That was part of the trade because the climate of India was very favorable. Well, then the British conquered parts of India and took over the opium growing, but they couldn't take over China during the 1700s. So instead they developed a trade of uh, selling opium to China and in return they bought tea. So if you look at the world of the 18, late 1700s and 1800s, it's all around drugs in a way. The tea was treasured in Europe because they didn't have other forms of caffeine at that time. Coffee was from Africa and hadn't really come to Europe. And so the British loved their tea, but it was very expensive. The, the Chinese would not sell it, you know, for cheap. And it cost a lot to bring it to England. So in order to finance that, they sold opium to China. Now, the government of China, the emperor, was trying to stop this, but the British had ways of um, getting around the wishes. And so more and more people in, in China became addicted to smoking of opium. So then there was an effort to stop this. That's what resulted in the first and second opium war. China, in a sense, initiated against Britain. Unfortunately, the British had more advanced gunships. Chinese had isolated themselves and had fallen 50 or 100 years behind the armaments of the British. So the British defeated China twice and in a sense was allowed to keep the trade going of, of opium into China and, and tea back to England. And out of the second opium war came Hong Kong. China gave the British Hong Kong as a concession for losing the war. So opium was very prevalent in not only Asia, but all over Europe and the United States uh, in the 1800s. It's so around that time, the syringe was also invented. So you had pure morphine, you had the syringe, and this was available at the time of the Civil War. So the horrible injuries that happened in the Civil War, some of them were treated with morphine, and there was some morphine addicts coming out of the Civil War. But that more or less subsided after that war. But the rise of injecting morphine with a syringe and getting addicted to it that way, that kept going up. And by the end of the 1800s, Bayer Pharmaceuticals based in Germany, which was one of the big phar early pharmaceutical companies, they invented heroin. So when heroin became available as a cough syrup, that's how Bayer Pharmaceuticals initially marketed heroin as a cough syrup. Uh, there were some people, particularly in the United States, who had already become morphine addicts, injecting morphine. And this was, this had moved now from the middle class to more of the, the gangs and the younger, lower socioeconomic group. In, in New York and other cities, um, when they tried the heroin, it worked twice as well as morphine, so heroin became twice as popular. And the rise of addiction to heroin began, and then when the prohibition against opiates came in around the First World War, the heroin addict took on a, a very criminal, sinister image and that image of the opiate addict as the lowest of the low has persisted in our society and has created um, some of our big problems with addiction uh, so that 
physicians through the 20th century were afraid to prescribe morphine when it was needed because they were very afraid of the authorities that if they gave too much morphine and created an addiction that they would be punished by the authorities and that their patients would become stigmatized in the same way that the heroin addict was stigmatized. But of course the pendulum then swings. We, we bring out Oxycontin, we treat more patients, but some of that Oxycontin gets diverted into addictive use and the pendulum swings to restrict opiates. So we, we, we live in an era when the pendulum swings towards doctors being promoted, uh, encouraged to, to use opiates, so the pendulum swings to being fearful of using opiates. And the, the basic thing is that few doctors are trained properly in medical school about really how to treat chronic pain, how to treat addiction. Although these things are a big part of every physician's practice, very little attention is directed to it in our training. And now though with, uh, with greater awareness, all physicians, for example, in the state of California to renew their license have to take a course every five years or so in the treatment of pain. So we're starting to uh, get some improvement there. Thank you, Doctor. And in wrapping up, is there anything else you would like to tell our listeners? Uh, well, I'd like to just say that um, addressing all of these drug issues, I think, could have a real benefit on, the, on some of the really big issues in the world. And also opening up our minds and learning about why we have the laws that we have, how it evolved, looking at the history of this, I think should become more part of our common knowledge that things didn't always exist like they do now and things don't have to stay the way they're now. We can evolve into a system where we don't criminalize, we don't imprison people who have drug problems. And also we could evolve into a system where doctors are knowledgeable and can use drugs in a way that do not get people addicted, but yet can offer compassionate relief of, of pain conditions and other psychological suffering that people go through. That would be my message to end with. Thank you very much.
just heard Gloria Lowe with doing an interview with Dr. Howard Kornfeld. The next piece you're going to hear is a piece by myself, Melody, and it's it's about some young kids that were hanging out on H Street and and the culture of their drug use. Here it is. It's a warm 70 degree day in San Francisco. I came up to H Street with the intention of talking to a few of the many panhandling street kids that I pass by every time I come up here. I see them with their dogs and their signs, but I have never thought of giving them money. It is something that happens when you live in cities long enough. You become desensitized to people asking for change on the streets. And honestly, with these kids, I never had that much sympathy. I thought that they chose to be out here so that they could do drugs without the harassment of their parents. I pictured them having homes a few blocks away or just over the bridge in Marin. But I realized that I was wrong. These kids deserve compassion, even if they do have a parent's home close by. Because we don't know their story, and most of us do not understand the nature of drug use and experimentation. We don't see the many small moments that occur when a child is trying to reconcile the world around them. Pain, confusion, and sometimes purely their curiosity for knowing for themselves what they have been told to stay away from are a few of the reasons a kid decides that it is okay for them to try drugs. I walk down Hate Street looking for people to talk to so that I can hear it from them why they are there and why they do drugs. I head into Golden Gate Park and head to an area called Hippie Hill. It is beautiful out and the park is packed. There are about 20 crowds of people hanging around. I lose my nerve and rest by a group of kids. Finally, after almost an hour, I get up and approach the group I was sitting next to. They look at me with suspicion and ask me if I'm a narc, an undercover drug enforcement officer. Out of the eight kids, one girl tells me why she is there. She is a sweet girl, so tough and rugged with dyed pink hair. This is her story. My name is Tetris. I'm 16 years old. My drug of choice is ecstasy. And the reason I've done ecstasy is because I've had trouble in the past with my parents. I went through this huge scene where I was adopted and ended up running away a couple times and just really messed up my life. I got sent to a group home. It's where I first smoked weed when I was 12 years old and I've been smoking weed ever since. I started smoking cigarettes when I was nine. Daily, I smoke weed like a lot. The reason I smoke weed is because it satisfies me when, I, when I'm feeling like not in a good mood. I just want to like doze off somewhere and look at something. The reason I've done any drugs is because I've gone through some pretty terrible experiences. And alcohol, alcohol, when I drink alcohol, I get, I get, I get silly too. It just satisfies me when I'm not in a good mood. It's like my medicine kind of. And I honestly, like, if I had the choice, I'd probably drink my pain away, like, every day. But I don't. I'm sober today. And I had a really bad hangover this morning. Kind of living on the streets right now. Got in a fight with my parents, and I told them I was going to get emancipated. And they said, all right, do so. So I left, and I've been living in San Francisco ever since, which was January. She is from Kentucky, and I asked her how she made it out to San Francisco. She does not have an ID. ID is needed for flying, and because she is underage, a valid ID is required on Greyhound as well. I actually traveled and train hopped with my dog, Loki, and a couple of my kids and my boyfriend at the time. We were all really drunk and we hopped a train. And then we went back to Bakersfield after we left this rainbow gathering. It's a place where a bunch of hippies get together, get naked and drunk and high. I met this kid there, and ended up being my boyfriend. She tells me what her favorite thing about train hopping is. The rush you get when you like go to jump on that three foot wheel, uh, grab that ladder. I wonder why she does drugs. Why did she start? It makes me happy. I'm really nice. You know, like, it, either way, you know, every drug, when I get intoxicated with a drug, I'm always happy. No, I'm never mad. I'm just a chill person. I'm pretty crazy though. I, want to be. I also wonder how she feels about San Francisco. In San Francisco, it gets pretty damn cold if you're a street kid and you got no blankets. <laughs> I have been sleeping with my homie because he's got a van that I don't have to sleep outside. I ask her how she makes the money. I, I ask people for money. I fly signs. I ask her if she wants to say anything to kids that may be listening to the show. 
Uh, those kids that haven't done drugs, I guess I'd say stay sober because it's not really that great if you're not on the street, you know? You're going to end up like me, you know? You're going to be 16 out on the street doing drugs. And, I mean, I know people that have done heroin and a lot of bad, bad drug choices. And just for them. And I know people that are being nuts now because of it. Don't let the reality of drugs take you over. folks that brings us to the end of tonight's show tune in next week to full circle at 7 p.m right here on kpfa 94.1 fm our website is firstvoicemap.org you can also check out our archive shows on kpfa.org special thanks to our production and technical interns from 33 and a third revolutions the first voice media action program melody laura golda gloria carl and myself angie d our executive producers are R.G. and Miss M. Our technical director is Frank Sterling. Our intro music is produced by Source of Labor. Our outro music is produced by B. Tondre. If you have questions or topics for future shows, give us a call at 510-848-6767, extension 627, or send an email to fullcircle at kpfa.org. With Angela holding down the controls, I mean, Gloria is holding down the controls tonight.